Good afternoon. My name is Jeffrey Herbst. I am president of American Jewish University in Los Angeles. Today, I'll be talking with former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome. Thank you for having me. The pleasure. Thank you for joining us from Tel Aviv so late at night. As the audience well knows, Ehud Barak was the 10th Prime Minister of Israel from 1999 to 2001. He also served previously as Defense Minister and Deputy Prime Minister, one of the most decorated soldiers in Israel's, in Israel's history. He also served as Chief of the General Staff. He's now starred in and helped produce a fascinating documentary called What If? Ehud Barak on War and Peace. Mr. Prime Minister, many leaders produce memoirs uh, which try to justify and I dare say glorify their actions during office. Your documentary is different. It looks at both your achievements, of course, uh, but also criticisms and mistakes you might have made. Why did you make this documentary, documentary now? So first of all, I was uh, approached by a thoughtful, uh, gifted young person called Juan Tal, the director of this documentary. He mentioned Errol Morris and McNamara uh, documentary, Fog of War, which I've seen and was impressed. He asked me, why don't we make something like this? So I'm not uh, very young anymore. I'm uh, half a year older than President Biden that you mentioned. I know him for decades. Um, and I thought that probably uh, it's relevant for the present time as well. I can say that a nation which cannot look honestly into its past would not uh, probably understand its present challenges and will have a clouded future. So I see that it makes sense to look honestly into the past and tell ourselves what happened, what if, and what might be the lessons that should be carried into the future. Prime Minister, the last part of the documentary uh, deals with Camp David, uh, the diplomatic um, episode that you're most closely associated with and was one of the most dramatic uh, in the history of Middle East diplomacy. Uh, I'd like to explore a little bit about your thinking about Camp David and your retrospective. Um, I was talking with Ambassador Indic yesterday and he argued, although he was there at the time and participated, that in retrospect, going for a comprehensive settlement may have been a mistake, that it might have been better to go with the phased approach of Oslo. You obviously disagreed at the time. What was your thinking in trying to go for with President Clinton for a comprehensive solution? I think that uh, Ambassador Indic is wrong. And I think that we did not try to reach peace agreement. We reached we could not even, we did not pretend to reach more than framework agreement. And through the negotiation, unlike the, the uh, urban legends that were uh, uh, kind of uh, spread over the world after the event, we never tried, and neither myself nor uh, President Clinton, to dictate to Arafat a solution, to tell him this is the comprehensive peace we have in our minds, take it or leave it. No. We just make an extremely far-reaching proposal that covered probably nine, 90 plus percent of what he can ever dream of and ask him to take it as a basis for negotiations. We told him explicitly, you can have reservation from this or that paragraph or from every paragraph, write them down, let us know, but let's take it as a basis for negotiation. He rejected it and deliberately uh, turned to terror. So it's, you know, I can understand a devoted civil servant like Indic, and there are several others of them who worked so hard about it, and they could not stand the temptation to look with certain sense of guilt and, and look for some, some mistakes that you've done, which are all imagined. It's not a coincidence that both myself and Clinton look at it. We did it open minded, we were ready to go very far and we couldn't find a partner at the time for uh, this, uh, this uh, step. I should tell you that at the time, there was reason why I uh, uh, tried to, to make it more urgently. When I took power, 
we were six years after Oslo, three years after the mutually agreed time for a start negotiation on permanent uh, a state kind of a uh, solution. Uh, the Europeans already warned us that they are going to recognize a Palestinian state even without an agreement. We had a uh, President Clinton who invested six years in this project and knew every detail. We knew that in a year and a half there will be another president. It might take a year or a year and a half to, to um, uh, just to train him to understand everything. And in the background, there was the clear signs of a major clash that might happen if we do not move according to what we and the Americans committed ourselves to. So it was an attempt. I described the following way. We have a, a two apartments kind of a cottage with a, one is a, a Israel, the other is the Palestinian side. Both uh, land, uh, householders, uh, myself and Arafat, are wanting from both sides to put down a fire that is about to explode. And the other guy, Arafat, already, already carries the kind of uh, great uh, Nobel Prize of firefighters on his chest. And you don't know whether, whether he's not the guy, the guy who is uh, the pyroman who is going to light it with, with the matches and the um, gasoline in his pocket. So you cannot, you cannot remove the fog of real history just by wishing or praying. The only way is to put your hands into the fire and to test it. Prime Minister, you had studied Arafat. You had planned to kill him. Uh, you had talked about him. Uh, I think you had talked with him perhaps previously. Were you surprised at his reaction at the end of Camp David? Not really. You know, when I was asked before I went there, what are the chances that we will achieve something? Because, you know, media people were convinced that there is some, some, something already agreed upon and was really, it's behind us. They saw that that would happen with Egypt, that would happen with Jordan. And we basically came to celebrate something that is basically agreed upon. I told them that it's 50-50. Not because I know something that bring me to this judgment, because there are two possibilities, either succeed or fail, and there is no way to know. But we have a, a, a kind of supreme responsibility to check it. Because if we do not check it, and we end in the, at the, at the end of this slippery slope, ending with a major clash with violence and many people buried on both sides of the conflict, we have to be able to tell ourselves, our people, our friends in America and the rest of the world that we really tried, that we really did our best. It's too heavy responsibility to fall into major clash and being unable to tell yourself to, to try honestly and physically to avoid it. So I gave the IDF my army. I was at the same time both prime minister and minister of defense. I ordered as a commander in chief in a way, I ordered the IDF to prepare for a full clash with the Palestinians because we had even pieces of information that led to it. But it could not relieve me from a sincere, determined effort to avoid this major clash because, before it erupts. There'll be future Middle East negotiations. What's the lesson of Camp David for future negotiators? When we end it, I told uh, people, whether it takes five, 15, or 50 years, it's already 20 years, whether it takes five, 15, or 50, when the time will come to sign an agreement between us and Palestine, and the time will come. You will need magnifying glass to see the differences between what was already in the on the table at Camp David and what will be agreed. Because the, you know, Napoleon used to say, you need to understand strategy, look at the map, you understand 90, 90% 90 of it looking at the map. Uh, nothing will uh, change. The same mountains, the same uh, ridge, the same uh, valleys, everything will be the same. The same cities, the Palestinians are not going to evaporate and we are not going to uh, fall on our knees. 
So the only thing that will grow will be the, the graveyard. And I told Arafat more than once, it will grow much faster on your side. And it won't be solved in heaven, it's we. Uh, individuals, living individuals on earth have to solve it and we happen to be the two leaders right now. So if we fail to do it, you know, our peoples will pay the price. And I told him the toughest decision you will have to make will not be vis-a-vis -vis me or Clinton. It will be vis-a-vis -vis the eyes of your own people because you have to take painful decisions on their behalf. The real challenge for me will not be just you. It will be my own people. I have to convince something that many of them with all their hearts and all their, their personality believe that what I'm doing is wrong. And uh, this is the real challenge we have to be able to overcome. So I don't know the answer. Probably he carried in mind this idea that he is a, a as he used to say, he's a general that never lost a, 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 a battle and he had these theatrical uh, clothes, always with a weapon and some, some khaki uh, uh, uniform. Uh, probably he was not ripe to change from a leader of a revolution to a leader of a state, which means to deal with social security, with education, with sewage, with uh, you name it. And probably he just dreamed or thought that nations should be born in blood, not in a air-conditioned negotiating room. I cannot, I cannot decide between those options, but the fact is that he, he could he could not take, he did not take the decision. I would not say he could not, he could, but he did not. And he turned to terror deliberately. That was what made him responsible for whatever followed. What do you think would have to change on the Palestinian side for a different leader uh, to, come to, uh, to come to an agreement? Uh, you know, Dr. Kissinger said once, uh, 50 years ago, that uh, this type of conflicts where two communities is bleeding into each other hands for, for decades, for centuries sometimes, they end with the two sides are in a way uh, exhausted and doesn't see anymore the, the reason to keep it. We are not, uh, we, you know, some Palestinians genuinely saw that Israel is something that will somehow collapse. We are not planning to collapse. Israel is the strongest country, 1,000 uh, miles around Jerusalem, both militarily, strategically, everyone thinks that we are even a nuclear uh, power uh, in our economy, which is not the biggest, but by far the, the most vibrant one in the, in the region. And with the American support and this law of the QME uh, that commits the, the United States to keep qualitative, qualitative military edge of Israel over any combination of neighbors. If we want the relationship with the two parties, with the American public and with whoever was elected by the American people to be their president, uh, we will remain in every foreseeable future the strongest uh, player. But that should not, should not make us arrogant or ignoring the need to solve the issues of the other side. Not in order to, to answer our needs for security, for clear future, for protecting our destiny and our own uh, kind of, uh, um, to keep holding, Israel has to keep holding to the moral high ground. Something that the recent government in Israel the last five years did not respect, did not even pretend to appear as the way we have the moral high ground. And that was a major mistake. Israel is based, our, our survival in this hostile region is based on our capabilities, on our strengths, but at the same time of, on our gift, together with going, being stronger, ready to answer, ready always to fight and win, to hold strongly to the moral high ground we which will create the justification for Israel deep in the collective psyche of the advanced peoples in the world, including uh, within the public of, of our best friend, the United States. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, another fascinating part of the documentary, which I recommend to the audience and 
a link to what you can find in the chat function, is a, a discussion of targeted assassinations of uh, terrorist leaders and foreign leaders. You were asked as a soldier to carry out some of those assassinations. Uh, as a leader, you were uh, you decided whether they should be implemented or not. How did how, with the benefit of hindsight, have you thought about the benefits, risks? of target assassinations, especially in relationship to uh, what you just said about Israel having the moral high ground in the region? No, uh, I don't think that that contradicts the moral high ground if it's done properly. You know, the real difference, Arafat used to argue when I uh, used to tell, but you know, you, you behave as a, as a terrorist, you have a blood on your head, say, uh, he told Clinton, but Barack in Shachak, there was another general uh, minister, a former general in our mission. Uh, they also have blood on their hands because I killed, uh, I killed uh, uh, some terrorists from, from uh, close distance where you can see the, the white in their eyes. Uh, I never regretted it because I, as I told Arafat, we acted upon the orders of a freely elected government in a, a democracy. And we never went after uh, innocent civilians, uh, uh, elderly people or kids. We did never try to terrorize the Palestinian people. We tried to kill terrorists. And it's true that at certain cases, innocent people were killed. I led, uh, I personally led a raid on on uh, the apartment of three terrorist leaders at the heart of Beirut several months after the assassination uh, of our uh, athletes at the, at the Munich uh, Olympics in 72. And one of the, the wife, the wife of one of these, uh, these um, terrorists stood behind him when he was shot and she was also killed. That's something that, that it's regrettable. When we killed Musawi, there was his uh, wife and a, a son in the car and they killed. So it happens that innocent people, but we never did it in order to reach this purpose, which is the opposite under the uh, terrorists that you, Arafat, sent and keep sending and still threatening to send. So we will never feel apologetic about, you know, I realized that it's not a problem. It's not a real challenge to mobilize among uh, incited people, individuals who will be ready even to commit suicide. And you cannot threaten, you cannot, uh, you cannot frighten people who is, uh, someone who is ready to, to uh, carry out a suicide uh, uh, attack. But the short supply are capable leaders who can lead it. And if you are the part of fight of terror, kill those people who are knowingly prepare, plan, and finance and send people to kill innocent civilians. Uh, it's uh, the 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 world was better without this need, but I I don't hesitate to do it. That's part of the needs of fighting terror uh, for a country living in such a, a terrible kind of bizarre neighborhood like the Middle East. It's nothing to compare to the Midwest. Middle East is something different. This is not like the Midwest, for sure. Uh, uh, Prime Minister, another one of your important actions was, was the withdrawal from Lebanon, um, where Israel had been mired for many years. And, and in a fascinating discussion, you say, that it's very difficult for leaders to cut their losses. And I think you even say that in English uh, in the documentary. Um, of course, Lebanon's had many problems since and uh, uh, the withdrawal of Israel uh, uh, eventually led to the rise of Hezbollah and uh, a lot of other uh, instabilities. But why was it so difficult for Israel to get out of Lebanon for so long? First of all, there's dynamic that even Americans someday will understand. When there is a, a period of a tough fighting with many casualties, uh, we say, okay, gentlemen, we, we cannot discuss now any kind of withdrawals or any kind of exit or change. 
we do not yield under pressure. It's the first commitment of uh, fighting. But then the camp period, which is uh, quiet, and you raise the idea, why don't we <laughs> correct this, this uh, anomaly? And the answer is, what's the problem? Why should we do it? Then come another time of period of successes of terror. They are successful all, also from that time. Once again, it's not the time to raise it because we don't uh, take decision under pressure. We don't yield to, to terror. And then come again. So if it would have happened over two years, I would say, okay, that's normal. Everyone is human beings, uh, including political leaders and commanders in the field, everyone. But if it takes 15 years, that's crazy. And it shouldn't happen. It could, be, have, have, could have been justified if the presence in Lebanon would protect the security of Israel. But that was not the case from day one. So I can tell you that even when we entered to Lebanon, 18 years before I pulled out from Lebanon, I was already a ranking general. I headed our uh, intelligence community. My opposite number in uh, Washington was uh, Bill Casey sitting in Langley, Virginia. And I told our leaders, when we planned the withdrawal from Beirut or from the, the areas around Beirut, why the hell we have to stay in Lebanon? Why, why, why to create a, a, a South Lebanese army that will become immediately a kind of traitors or collaborators with the enemy in the eyes of the Lebanese people. Let's go out of Lebanon. Don't, no, the, no presence beyond the border. We can over, always make a raid, but not permanent presence. And let them establish five different militias, a Druze militia in the east, a Christian militia behind it, uh, besides it, a Shiite militia, everyone according to the uh, ethnical structure or religious structure of the people. And we can help them underground. Why, why the hell we have to be there? By then they are uh, uh, legitimate because in Lebanon there were at the time 52 militias. So they, instead of 52, there will be 56, that's normal. I told our leaders, it will, we will suffer from the same mistake that we had <coughs> years uh, before along the canal after the six days war. We didn't want to see Egyptians sailing in the canal after we conquered all Sinai in 73. Uh, not conquering, but basically uh, crossing the, the canal and, and, and encompassing the, the Third Army. But after the war in 67, we controlled the whole Sinai and we didn't want to see them. So we put a uh, small, small uh, squadrons on the on the shore of bank of the canal to block it, and they start to shoot. It's two hundred yards. They shot. We shot. We have to we make some some uh, foxhole, then to cover it, then to build. And within short time, it became a reinforced kind of line. It's called Barlev line. And we protected it as if we are protecting the walls of Jerusalem. It, it was ridiculous. We caught into the, uh, the complication of ourselves. I don't want to, to make the audience kind of uh, tired from uh, listening to detailed tactical issues. But I said we should not be there. And I, I visited soldiers in Lebanon. And they told me, we are not worried, General, don't worry. We are just caring about our kids back in the cradles in, in Israel. And it ended up that 18 years later, I became not a ranking general, but the prime minister, minister of defense. And I see now the kids from the cradles, they are now dying in Lebanon for no reason whatsoever. They are not even, they cannot even protect Israel against short range missiles and rockets coming over their heads on the Israeli population. So I said, that's ridiculous, and I will go out. I commit myself before election, and I just implement it against a huge, kind of not physical rebellion, but huge resistance from within the army, from the political, from everyone. And everyone now, in retrospect, 20 years ago, thank you. The people still thanking me for doing it, for saving their life, the life of, the, of their uh, beloved ones, and whatever. And that's, that's you know, Leadership is about making decisions, 
not between a good alternative and bad alternative, it's a, a easy choice, and not between two good alternatives, because it doesn't matter which one you choose, it's always between two bad alternatives. But still, it should not paralyze you. You have to look through all the fog to look and decide what is the essence of it. Is it needed or just a kind of, is it, is it fake something? fake prestige, fake national pride, fake something else, or it's real. If it's real, fight for it, be ready to die for it. If it's fake, admit it and take action. Prime Minister, I mean, that was a fascinating analysis. Let me ask you about the decision, one of the decisions of your successor, Ariel Sharon, uh, to pull out of Gaza. Do you think that was, it's not covered in a documentary because you, didn't, you weren't involved in the decision directly. In hindsight, how do you evaluate that decision? It was a courageous decision of a, the man who established the Jewish settlement there. He fought for them. He made a lot of political tweaks. He fought for them here and there. When he became a little bit older and he knew that he won't be there forever, and he decided to leave an imprint of something serious, he found that there is no justification whatsoever to stay there. So he took the, <laughs> mastered the courage and decided and ordered and executed. And there was a lot of criticism still the, uh, uh, until now. But when you ask people, including right wingers, assume that there is a wizard that will promise you that we can come back to the status quo ante, to the situation before we withdrew from Gaza, with the settlements there, everything, without any soldier wounded on the way. Would you go for it? They think for a while, say no. So that's the ultimate proof that Sharon was right. If people are not, uh, that's the same that I asked about Lebanon. Would you be ready to go there, uh, back there, even if it would not take any loss? of life or wounded person. No, 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 thank you, don't, don't bring it up. But people do not remember. We lost much more many lives of soldiers and settlers during the last year before we withdrew than in any other year since then. Prime Minister, 21 years on, is there still a chance of a two-state solution with more than 500,000 Jewish settlers in the West Bank, or is that just wishful thinking? No, it's not wishful thinking. It's not easy. It's probably is not practical uh, this year with this government at this stage. But we should never lose sight of it. We should always be strong, try to stick to the moral high ground, and never lose sight of the need to disengage from Palestine. I will explain in very shortly. Between the Mediterranean and Jordan River, there live now some 14 million people. There are 9 million Israelis. Uh, 5 million Palestinians, but among the Israelis, there are 2 million Arabs. And uh, it's a, all in all, there are about half of them. So if there will be only one political unit over this whole area named Israel, it will become inevitably, that's the key word to inevitably, either non Jewish or non democratic. If the, these Arabs can vote to the Knesset, all of them, it will become overnight by national state with probably 45, 55 um, relations. And within a generation or so, it will be become a bi national state with Muslim majority. That's not the Zionist dream. If they cannot vote, not until the next round of negotiation, if they cannot permanently vote and still have to live in millions against their uh, political instinct and national wishes under Israel control, that's not democracy. I don't want to use a, a, a names in, in a, a kind of a, whatever in some Dutch-like language for, from a, the neighboring a, continent in the previous century, but it's, basically, it's not democracy. And that's both, uh, so the vision of one state, which in fact was the vision of uh, at least of uh, 
‫אחד הוא זיזני מקדאפי. ‫קדאפי סורט אוף וואן ישראסטין, ‫היא קוראת את ישראל ופלסטין. ‫אנד סאם אדר ערב לידר סורט אוף איט ‫הסרטן פוינט, ‫זה הסתה של זיוניסט פרוג'קט. ‫וואן שטייט היא הסתה של זיוניסט פרוספקט ‫או פרוג'קט, ‫אבן אם היא סטרץ' אובר ‫את ג'נריישן, ‫זה לא נכון. ‫זה הכי דבר שאתה רוצה להתנגד. ‫אז אנחנו צריכים להתנגד ‫את הפוליטי הכרח. to delineate a line within the promised land within which we will have a solid Jewish majority for generations to come and all our uh, security uh, vital interests and beside which there is a place for a viable uh, demilitarized Palestinian state. We need it not because of justice for the Palestinians but in order to ensure our identity, our destiny, our future, our uh, coherence and solidarity from within. Um, Prime Minister, uh, another member of the audience writes uh, that he fears that the United States can no longer be relied upon to fully back Israel. Do you see a way that Israel can deal with the active threats posed by Iran and its proxies Hamas and Hezbollah? Yeah, I'm confident. I mentioned already, already earlier, Israel is and will remain in the, in the kind of uh, visible kind of future, uh, the strongest country thousand miles around Jerusalem, from Benghazi in Libya to Tehran, including Tehran. And uh, uh, I think that uh, everyone understands it's in the region. We never ask America to come to fight for us. And we are very grateful for America to help us in emergency in Mongo America, both, both, both by providing kind of diplomatic safety net, by backing us with munition and, and weapons and giving us military assistance along uh, two generations almost now. But we uh, are determined to be able to fight for ourselves. So in a way, we are not dependent upon the American readiness to go and we respect the American uh, decision to withdraw from the present. In fact, I can tell you honestly that all of these who say, okay, but you and the Saudis and the Egyptians and the Emirates together, you can face the challenge. You know, every one of our neighbors, I respect all of them. They have their own calculation. Uh, the Americans did not even, they just hinted that this is the direction and you immediately see the Saudis try to talk to the Iranians. The Emiratis um, uh, for Mr. yesterday, yesterday visited Damascus. Uh, the Egyptians are talking to Turkey. Uh, they are, they, they, you know, even in the Roman Empire, the Roman Empire held some 32 legions. They always, almost all of them were either along the Rhinus fighting with the old the German Visigoth or in Dalamatia fighting in the Balkan. The Middle East, they said, is run by politics. You always can have the, they only, they all know how to play politics. So it remained the same. So we, uh, uh, we built on ourselves. We built on our openness to other, we are strong enough. Having said that, there is a need to do whatever could be done by the Americans, the world, commu the, uh, world community, to block Iran from turning into a nuclear power. Not because Iran is going to throw immediately a, a, a bomb on Israel, they won't dare to do it, not now, not in, in the future, even if they had one. It's about breaking the whole regime of non-proliferation. If Iran turned nuclear, Turkey, I, I remember a conversation with uh, David Turlu when he was a uh, prime minister or, or minister of foreign affairs of Erdogan. He told me what choice we have. If the Iranians will turn nuclear, we'll have to turn nuclear as well. And Egypt will find itself compelled to turn nuclear and Saudi Arabia will turn nuclear. And that will be a signal to end of any um, kind of sustainable non-proliferation regime. By then, every dictator, third grade dictator in Africa or in the Far East will become nuclear. And the real risk is that down the stream, 30 years from now, 
some terrorist group will put its head on a crude nuclear device, which could be sent in a, in a container to, to uh, the, the uh, Oakland port. I removed it from Los Angeles or, or Rotterdam or Ashdod in Israel. And this is the real risk. So it, it justify a coordinated effort diplomatic or, or, or else in order to block them. But, you know, many mistakes were done in the last uh, years. I don't want to dive into it. It's not part of the, this documentary, probably the next one. And uh, but both, on both sides of the Atlantic, a lot of mistakes were done, which, uh, which were, had, had good intentions, but ended up with Iran much closer to, uh, to a breakthrough than, uh, than it, it was just six and a half years ago. Prime Minister, several audience members found your remarks on Lebanon uh, and the withdrawal to be fascinating and want to know about how Israel will deal with the current threat from Lebanon, Hezbollah, a fractured and failing state. How do you see uh, uh, Israel's relations with Lebanon evolving? Look, uh, we are focused on uh, uh, keeping our shop <laughs> Together politically, it's not easy. Uh, we cannot we, we cannot replace the <laughs> Lebanese in correcting their system. Whoever will try to help or support will become marked on his forehead as a collaborator with the enemy. It it will damage. If we want to damage certain factions there, we have to announce that we are going to help them. So we cannot help them. It's a, 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 a it's I don't envy them. I pity them. It, it was a, a crown jewel of the Middle East, Beirut, and, and it deteriorating because they let Hezbollah be not just a terror organization, but a major political power. They have one third of the uh, minister, they have a veto power on the government, and that's bad because basically, you know, they are, they are using Lebanese national assets in order to keep alive the friction with Israel. So they have a lot of uh, missiles. We are uh, we are running a kind of campaign, part of it under the surface, even a kind of kinetic campaign, I may say, to block the establishment of infrastructure for building these uh, missiles, especially accurate, high precision missiles uh, for the uh, Hezbollah in Syria or the moving along, uh, along the ground kind of corridor from Iran through Iraq to Syria to Lebanon. I call it the Shiite banana. And uh, we, we are trying to slow it down. I have no illusion. We cannot totally block it. It's uh, in few months, uh, the autumn will turn into winter, a few weeks. And in the winter, there are enough opportunities to, to bring uh, truckloads of missiles and equipment uh, when, uh, when a, an effective air force operation is impossible. So we work to slow it down and we are ready. We don't look for a clash, but if something will be imposed upon us, it will cost a huge destruction to Lebanon. I strongly recommend it even before, but uh, now for sure, before the 2006 war, uh, we try to, to convey to the Lebanese through the Americans and others, be careful when you allow the uh, Hezbollah to attack Israel, we hold Lebanon to be responsible. First night, you won't have a, an airport. The second night, you won't have any, any overfly in your roads and no uh, electric power, third, third day, uh, night, you won't have um, the kind of seaport. And uh, we, we would not touch hospital, we would not touch uh, drinking water, we would not touch uh, school, and we would not touch even the parliament. But everything else is a fair game because you are allowing the Hezbollah to attack directly our civilian population. And uh, I hope that they will think twice, but no one can uh, assure it. Ehu Barak, former Prime Minister of Israel, thank you so very much. Congratulations on your new documentary, What If Ehud Barak on War and Peace. 